Here at, the, at, at Richmond Law, we have a tradition of hosting events um, to encourage not only civil engagement, but civil discourse. For the past three presidential elections, we've sponsored a debate uh, between um, the environmental spokespeople for the presidential candidates. So long tradition there. And, and two weeks from today, our faculty members will partner with members of the community to debate the topic of gerrymandering in the first of a new series we're calling A Civil Discourse. So in other words, we welcome the opportunity to bring people together to discuss divergent views on important topics that matter to all of us and to do so in a, a civil, uh, respectful, if sometimes passionate, uh, discourse. I should add that um, next week, the, here uh, on campus, the gubernatorial candidates will have a, um, a, a forum. Um, a, not quite the same uh, um, uh, debate format, but um, a question and answer with President Crutcher. So we're looking forward to that as well. So we're very pleased to welcome Justin Fairfax and Senator Jill Vogel to this town hall and debate in the campaign for lieutenant governor. So please now join me in welcoming Jeremy Williams, chair of the Virginia Bar Association Young Lawyers Division. Jeremy. Uh, thank you, thank you, Dean Perdue. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome uh, to the Virginia Bar Association Young Lawyers Division Lieutenant Governor's Debate. Uh, as Dean Perdue indicated, my name is Jeremy Williams, and I have the privilege of serving as the chair of the Young Lawyers Division this year. Uh, for those who are unfamiliar with the Virginia Bar Association, we are the largest statewide voluntary bar association. The VBA is the independent voice of the Virginia lawyer, advancing the highest ideals of the profession through advocacy and volunteer service. The Young Lawyers Division is a subset of the VBA, comprised of those lawyers who are 37 years of age or younger or have been in practice for three years or less. The YLD has 800 members throughout the state and we run 30 projects, all of which are committed to giving back to the community and to the borrower. One of our projects is the Town Hall Meetings Project, uh, which is responsible for putting together this debate tonight. At this time, I want to recognize three individuals with whom this would, with, without whom this would have not happened. Uh, Andrew Garahan, the chairman of the Town Hall Meetings Project, Ashley Allen, the chair-elect, and my predecessor, who I did not let off the hook this year, uh, Stephen Gould, the immediate past chair of the Virginia Bar Young Lawyers uh, Division. Please, give me, please join me in giving them a round of applause. I also want to thank the University of Richmond and the University of Richmond Law School for allowing us to use your facilities and graciously hosting us, and the University of Richmond Law School Council uh, for providing volunteers and helping us with coordination efforts. Since at least 2001, the YLD has hosted a lieutenant governor's debate every four years. Obviously, this year is no exception. Tonight, we are extremely privileged and honored to have with us two great candidates, uh, for Lieutenant Governor, an accomplished and well-respected moderators and panelists. Our candidates tonight include Justin Fairfax. Mr. Fairfax was raised primarily by a single mom and his grandparents in a neighborhood besieged by guns, drugs, and gangs. He saw childhood friends fall victim to the culture of crime and violence that threatens many Virginia communities. Those experiences led him to a career in public service, starting with his tenure as the Assistant U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of Virginia in the Major Crimes and Narcotics Unit of the Alexandria Division. Mr. Fairfax received a scholarship to attend Columbia Law School, where he was selected to be a member of the Columbia Law Review. He also received a scholarship to attend Duke University, where he graduated with a degree in Public Policy Studies. Mr. Fairfax and his wife Serena and their two children live in Northern Virginia where they own a home and thriving family dental practice. Senator Jill Vogel was born in Roanoke and raised in the Shenandoah Valley. Senator Vogel graduated from Central High School in Woodstock, Virginia, got her Bachelor of Arts degree in Government and Religion from the College of William and Mary, and her law degree from DePaul University in Chicago. Senator Vogel started her own business and is the managing partner of a law firm she has built into a nationally recognized practice specializing in ethics, charities, and nonprofits. During her career, she held policy positions in and out of government, including serving as Deputy General Counsel at the U.S. Department of Energy. 
In 2007, Senator Vogel is elected to the Senate of Virginia representing parts of Northern Virginia and the Shenandoah Valley, where for eight years she was the only Republican woman in the Senate and she made history when she was the first person to have a child while serving in the General Assembly. Senator Vogel lives in Fauquier County with her husband Alex and their four children, ages 5, 8, 11, and 14, and two older stepchildren. Uh, our moderators and panelists tonight are Dr. Bob Holdsworth. Uh, Dr. Holdsworth is one of the leading political analysts um, in Virginia. He was recently named one of the 100 influentials in Virginia politics by Campaigns and Elections magazine. The author of five books and numerous articles on public policy and American politics, he was the founding director of both the Center for Public Policy and the Wilder School of Government and Public Affairs at VCU. Dr. Holdsworth is currently a managing principal at Decide Smart a firm that provides analysis and planning assistance to agencies, local governments, nonprofits, and private sector companies with governmental interest. Dr. Holdsworth served as chair of Governor McDonald's Independent Bipartisan Advisory Commission on Redistricting and served as executive director of Governor Warner's Commission on Efficiency and Effectiveness in Virginia State Government. He currently serves on the Board of Visitors for Virginia Commonwealth University and is chair of the board of the Great Aspirations Scholarship Program, GRASP. Dr. Holdsworth received his PhD from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Last but certainly not least, Bill Fitzgerald. Bill Fitzgerald has been the evening anchor of CBS 6 in Richmond for more than eight years. He previously anchored in Raleigh at WTVR and Birmingham at WVTM. Prior to his time in Raleigh, uh, Mr. Fitzgerald spent several years as an overnight and weekend anchor for MSNBC covering breaking news and top national stories of the day. Mr. Fitzgerald received his bachelor's degree in English and American Literature from Harvard and his master's degree in journalism from Columbia. He and his wife Amy have three children and live in Richmond. Ladies and gentlemen, give me, join me in giving a round of applause for our uh, candidates and moderator and panelists tonight and let the debate commence. Thank you, Jeremy, and thank you, Dean Perdue, for having us all here tonight. It's going to be a great night. As you heard, I'm Bill Fitzgerald, evening anchor at CBS 6, your moderator, along with Bob Holsworth, the managing partner at Decide Smart. I want to take some time, just a couple of minutes, to go over the rules of tonight's debate. First of all, neither Bob nor I am or is a spokesperson for the Virginia Bar on the topics discussed tonight. The views expressed are those of the candidates not those of the Virginia Bar Association, and by sponsoring the debate, the Bar is not endorsing any or either candidate. Importantly, we would like to ask audience members not to applaud or otherwise participate, at least not actively, in the debate, apart from your silent observation. You may applaud the candidate's introduction and again at the debate's conclusion, but anything else will detract from the time we have tonight. The candidates will be equipped only with a notepad and pen, no other props, each candidate will begin with an opening statement of up to two minutes with the first candidate chosen by coin toss. Then we will have four rounds of questions with two questions on each topic, each of four topics, with the first candidate, again, chosen by that coin toss. That candidate will have two minutes to respond to the question, followed by the second candidate who gets two minutes as well, followed by a one minute rebuttal from the first candidate. The order is then reversed for the second question on that topic. And then that candidate will also start the next round of questions and so forth. At the end of four rounds, time permitting, we will put two questions to the candidates from you, the audience, in the order that's already been established. You'll see representatives from the Young Lawyers Division uh, handing out uh, note cards. If you wish, you may jot down a question and they'll collect it and get it to us. And once the rounds of questions then are completed, each candidate will have two minutes to make a closing statement. So we appreciate your cooperation. And now I would like to introduce the candidates according again to that coin toss. The Republican candidate for Lieutenant Governor is State Senator Jill Vogel. And the Democratic candidate is Justin Fairfax.
And per the results of the coin toss, Senator Vogel, you may offer your opening statement. Thank you. Well, good evening. It is great to be with all of you. I want to say a special thank you to, uh, to everybody who's here participating, to our moderator, to our host, and to Justin Fairfax for being with us much. tonight. Thank you. Um, you heard the introduction a little bit about my bio, but I just wanted to take my opening time just to say a few words about what I have been doing in the Senate of Virginia to prepare me to be Lieutenant Governor. For 10 years, I have served in Virginia with my colleagues, working incredibly hard to make Virginia a well-managed state, state, working on our budget, chairing a finance subcommittee in charge of our state employees, the court system, technology. I have also worked incredibly hard always to put principle over politics and to work with my colleagues on the other side of the aisle because in a Senate that is divided 21-19, you cannot accomplish anything or pass any legislation unless you are able to work with your friends on the other side of the aisle. And during those 10 years, I have passed lots of significant legislation on issues related to health care, issues related to tax reform, regulatory reform, the environment, agriculture. And also during that time, I have never been afraid to break with my party on big issues that matter, like redistricting reform and ethics reform and non-discrimination. And in the course of those years, I have had the opportunity to work with extraordinary leadership in communities all around Virginia. And for that work, I have been recognized by groups like the Virginia State Police, the Chambers of Commerce, the League of Conservation Voters, the Clerks of the Court, the Commonwealth Attorneys Association for outstanding leadership. And I am incredibly proud of that work and that, com and that like, work in the community. And so I would just say to all of those of you who are here tonight that I would like to take that experience that proven leadership, and contribute as the next Lieutenant Governor of Virginia, committed to, again, put principle over party with a track record to prove that I can do that. And so, again, I appreciate your time tonight and your attention, and I would love, love to have your support in this Lieutenant Governor's race. Thank you. Mr. Fairfax, your opening statement. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Justin Fairfax. I am the Democratic nominee for Lieutenant Governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia. I want to thank our moderators uh, for hosting this great debate. I also want to thank the University of Richmond uh, Law School uh, for your hospitality. I want to thank Senator Vogel uh, for joining us here and uh, for participating. Uh, and I want to thank each of you uh, for taking the time to hear about what I think is one of the most important elections in the history of the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, we have a very dramatic and stark choice in this election. Uh, while I appreciate everything that Senator Vogel said, uh, this really is not about us individually, it's really about you. Uh, it's about the Commonwealth of Virginia, uh, and it's about the vision that we have uh, for moving this Commonwealth forward or taking us backwards. Uh, and our vision is one focused on economic growth, uh, making sure that people can move up the economic ladder, their wages can rise, that. Uh, they can get to live the American dream that I have been so blessed and fortunate to live myself. Uh, I want that for everyone. Uh, we are focused on making sure that we bring high paying jobs here to the Commonwealth of Virginia. The governor, uh, under his great leadership, just announced today uh, a $1 billion uh, Facebook data center uh, built right here uh, in East Henrico. Uh, that's the kind of leadership that we need going forward. The unemployment rate has gone down from 5.4% to 3.8%. Uh, in the last three and a half years. 215,000 new jobs have been created uh, in that time. $17.6 billion of additional capital has been invested in the Commonwealth of Virginia. We are moving in the right direction, uh, but we need to continue uh, that kind of positive, thoughtful leadership to grow our economy and to grow opportunities for all Virginians. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, Senator Vogel, who is a strong supporter uh, of President Donald Trump, uh, supported him during the campaign and, and even today, uh, who's been the most divisive president that we've ever had, uh, represents a vision that would take us backwards. Uh, she sponsored a bill that would force women to have an invasive ultrasound. She voted against the transportation bill in 2013. Uh, and that's not the kind of leadership that will take us forward. Uh, I'd be honored to earn your support and your vote on November the 7th. Thank you. Uh, the order of the first question has been chosen again by that coin toss. Bob and I have selected six general topics of discussion from which we will have two questions. Tonight's first topic has risen in importance in the last week. It is about guns or gun control. Bob is going to ask Senator Vogel that first question. Uh, Senator Vogel, you've received the endorsement of the NRA and the Virginia Citizens Defense League. Your website notes that you sponsored more pro-gun legislation 
than any other senator in 2017. Given the horrific massacre that just occurred in Las Vegas, could you explain why you believe that we shouldn't have stricter laws banning high-capacity magazines, assault weapons, and things such as um, bump stocks that we saw this week? Um, well, first I will tell you that was an absolute tragedy. And it speaks to a whole series of issues that really aren't related necessarily to gun laws, but on, a, on another level are related to issues related to mental health and some of the other issues, and perhaps that will be another question that we can address, but are very, very serious. Um, but from my perspective, in any piece of legislation that I approach or any time that I, I determine whether or not it's appropriate to restrict, restrict people's rights, I will first say, one, I'm not running for lieutenant governor to take anybody's rights away. And first, I decide, is it constitutional? Is it appropriate to take someone's rights away? Does it violate the Constitution? And number two, does it work? And in this case, um, if you restrict people's gun rights, it does violate the Constitution. And number two, as we have proven time and time again, take, taking people's gun rights away does not, does not restrict gun violence in the way that people believe it will. In the Clinton era, when we had very re much more restrictive um, laws, the Department of Justice did research and recently came out with a study and they said, no, it didn't actually work. And in places like Washington, D.C., I know Justin and I talked about this before in our earlier debate, in Washington, D.C., where he is from, they have among the most restrictive gun rights in the country, and yet they have more gun violence than anywhere else in the country. And when you restrict people's gun rights, all it does is take guns away from the people who are victims, from the people who most deserve the right to defend themselves. And among the groups of people who are actually acquiring guns at a, at a greater rate is women that are the fastest growing segment, segment of the population who are purchasing weapons. And it's because I think they feel more and more defenseless. And so it is not my position that I am running for lieutenant governor to take anybody's gun rights away. And just to speak to your, your question specifically about what happened in Las Vegas, we really don't have all the facts yet. We're less than 100 hours away from that event. And it's not clear to me that what he actually had, the weapon that he actually had, was legal. Mm. Mr. Fairfax, staying on that same topic, yes. you suggest the universal... Yes, two minutes. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to jump in. You have two minutes to respond. Oh, sure. No, I'm happy to. Uh, and, you know, unfortunately, Senator Vogel didn't really answer your question. Uh, and I'm going to answer it directly. Uh, I believe that what we saw... Uh, in Las Vegas is uh, yet another example of a mass shooting uh, that we have to take action to protect the safety uh, of all of those uh, citizens, uh, not only in the Commonwealth of Virginia, but around the country. Uh, I myself am a former federal prosecutor. I prosecuted violent gun crimes. I know what it means to keep our community safe. Uh, and we do not need to have uh, these military grade uh, assault weapons uh, on our streets uh, in the hands of people like the shooter in Las Vegas who shot upwards uh, of 600 people, uh, fired uh, an estimated 6,000 rounds uh, in the span of about 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, and Senator Vogel said that restricting someone's gun rights is violative of the Constitution. That's patently false. Uh, all of our rights in the Constitution uh, we support and believe in, but there are restrictions uh, on all of them when they are in the best interest uh, in the safety and the health uh, of our citizens. And so Senator Vogel may believe uh, that these uh, bump stocks are uh, permissible. Even the NRA, uh, who uh, she has an A-plus rating from, and she, she boasts, uh, she's not released her survey from the NRA, so we don't know what she told them to get that A-plus rating. But even they today uh, said that they would be open to talking about the bump stock issue, and so I don't know if she's to the right of the NRA uh, on that issue. Uh, but we do not need weapons where people can fire hundreds of rounds in a matter of minutes and cause the most amount of carnage to human beings as possible. These are not for hunting, these are not for sport, these are to kill the most number of human beings possible. And there are 58 um, dead Americans right now uh, in Las Vegas. There are over 500 people in the hospital, many of them fighting for their lives as we speak tonight. Uh, and if we can't speak with moral clarity in the wake of that kind of tragedy, uh, we have enough facts uh, to know what we need to do next. I think we need universal background checks. Uh, we need to ban these high capacity uh, magazines and these assault weapons uh, that are meant to kill the most people possible. Senator Vogel, you have a minute. Well, I would just again say what happened in Las Vegas was, a, was clearly an un, unspeakable tragedy, a criminal tragedy. And again, I would just say we don't have all the facts. Um, the ATF and Congress are planning to hold hearings about whether or not that actual weapon was in fact legal. We do not know. 
And I would just say again, um, I feel like that it is really important also to focus on victims, um, vic victims who do wish to have the opportunity to defend themselves. Women especially, and I've worked really closely with women who are victims of domestic violence who very much wish to have the opportunity to defend themselves. And I am, you know, very, very, um, I've been very consistent and unyielding on my, um, you know, my strong position on protecting people's Second Amendment rights. We'll move to the second question that I was a little premature on. Thank you, Bob. Uh, for Mr. Fairfax, uh, you suggest that universal criminal background checks, banning assault weapons, as you mentioned, uh, making it easier to stop troubled individuals from getting a weapon could have an impact on reducing gun violence. Uh, as Senator Vogel referenced across America, some jurisdictions, Chicago, Washington, D.C., have incredibly high rates of gun violence uh, despite some of the strictest gun laws in the country. Uh, as the murder rate has begun to inch up in a number of Virginia jurisdictions, uh, why should Virginians believe that your answers would address those real problems that they face in stopping gun violence? Yeah, well, uh, thank you for that question. First of all, uh, there's a fallacy here uh, because Senator Vogel talks about D.C. and Chicago around the country and the uh, gun crime rates there, but most of those guns that are used uh, in those crimes come from somewhere else. And that's kind of the point. Uh, they come from places that have lax gun laws, where people can go across the border to a neighboring state with lax gun laws. And again, it sounds like Senator Vogel thinks there should be no restrictions on any kind of gun. Uh, she said that we need to see whether or not the weapons he had were legal. My point is he was able to fire 600 rounds uh, you know, every couple of minutes. And that should not be legal. Whether or not it's legal today, it shouldn't be. And that's the point. Uh, I, you know, I can't think of people thinking about their loved ones at this concert. Uh, you know, and what they are now having to go through. Uh, and if we can't stand up with moral courage and moral clarity at this moment in time, uh, we have enough facts to do what we need to do to start to reduce not only these incidents of mass shootings, but to keep uh, people safe. I, again, have been endorsed by the Police Benevolent Association. I'm a former federal prosecutor of the Major Crimes and Narcotics Unit. Uh, I don't want people uh, who commit these mass shootings to be able to outgun law enforcement. And that's what we're seeing. Uh, and so she's also been uh, endorsed by the Virginia Citizens Defense League. They're to the right of the NRA. Uh, they want people to have machine guns. They want guns in K through 12 schools. They want guns in churches and mosques and synagogues. And they gave her 100% rating. Uh, this is not the time to equivocate. This is not the time, and by the way, the talking points I heard were the same ones I saw leaked from the Trump administration. Uh, so these are now talking points that are circulating around when we have real people's lives that are in danger and at stake. And so in these cities, in these jurisdictions where you're seeing this high gun violence, these guns for the most part are coming from places that have lax gun laws. There's something known as the Iron Pipeline uh, that goes up and down the East Coast, from Florida to the Mid-Atlantic, up to the Northeast, out to the Midwest in Chicago. Uh, and that's where these guns are being run. And that's also why we had one gun a month here uh, in Virginia passed by Governor Doug Wilder. Uh, that was repealed, and Senator Vogel voted for that repeal as well. Senator Vogel, you have two minutes. Okay, so I, I'm sorry, but that is absolutely, utterly not an excuse. To say that other states have different gun laws is not an excuse for the outrageous amount of gun violence in places like Chicago and Washington, D.C. Where was Justin Fairfax on the outrage of the fact that, you know, 50 people die and no one even bats an eye in some of those places, in some of those communities who are desperate for help? Let's talk about enforcing those gun laws. Let's talk about helping those communities. That is not Virginia's fault. That is 100% not Virginia's fault. And, and to say that, you know, somehow, you know, that respecting the, the, the right of responsible, law-abiding citizens to exercise their Second Amendment right is somehow our fault in those cities is, is wrong. That's 100% wrong. And to say that somehow, you know, he's better on law enforcement or any of those issues is also just patently false. I've been endorsed by um, the Fraternal Order of Police. I have worked in partnership with public safety for years and years and years to make our community safer, working with our Sheriff's Association and working with law enforcement and working to make certain that our communities are doing the right thing, but most of all, protecting the rights of law-abiding gun owners so that victims don't forget victims Never forget that in these communities, the people who feel the most vulnerable, the ones who most want the right to exercise their Second Amendment, are law-abiding citizens who are victims. You cannot forget victims in this discussion. And so I would just say that some of those, some of those points are terribly misguided and, in fact, frankly false. Mr. Fairfax, one minute. 
I'd, I'd welcome Senator Vogel being specific uh, and telling what she thinks is false. Uh, these are facts, and as I have told Senator Vogel before, facts are not attacks. Uh, we have to speak factually about what these issues are. Uh, it is a fact, and it does matter that you have the guns being used in gun crimes in these high crime jurisdictions coming from places with more lax gun laws. That is a fact. Uh, so I don't know how that's misguided or false. It's a fact, and you can refute that if you'd like, uh, but you need facts to do it. Uh, and as far as law enforcement, again, I was a federal prosecutor. I have prosecuted violent gun crimes. I stood in courtrooms just like this one with victims. Uh, whose rights we were trying to protect and our communities that we were trying to protect. Uh, and so it is not an excuse to say, and she says, where was Justin Fairfax? Uh, I'm outraged at all gun violence, uh, okay? And I always have been. Uh, but the point is we need to take actual steps to keep our community safer and using talking points from the Trump administration is not going to keep us safer. And if we can't do it in the wake of someone who shot upwards of 600 people, then we never will. We're going to move on to the next topic with two questions on energy and the environment. Bob? I think we're going to the economy next. Are we? <laughs> okay. Let's go to okay. the economy. We're, we're going to go economy. straight to the economy. Yeah, we'll, we'll do that. Um, Mr. Fairfax. Yes. Uh, you've proposed a statewide increase in the minimum wage to $15 per hour as a central feature of your economic strategy. But many economists believe the minimum wage increases are often counterproductive. Uh, Seattle, for example, recently raised its minimum wage, and a University of Washington study noted that the average low wage worker at the end saw a 6.6 percent decrease in their wages. What evidence do you have that the outcome of your proposal would be any different in Virginia than we saw in Seattle? Yeah, uh, several pieces of evidence. First of all, there were two studies that were done uh, out in the University of Washington and in Seattle, one that refuted some of the findings uh, of that particular study. Uh, they noted that they were looking at a minimum wage at the $13 level. Uh, and so, you know, there are, there are contrasting findings about uh, what the wages look like after that level. But here's, here's what we do now. Uh, Virginia is at $7.25 per hour. That is our minimum wage. We are $1.50 less than West Virginia. Uh, and so people are not able to afford to have economic mobility to take care of themselves, to take care of their families on those uh, kinds of low wages. And I think the very premise uh, that any increase, any marginal increase uh, in the minimum wage is counterproductive would mean that we never would, A, have a minimum wage and we never would have raised it. Uh, this is an argument that's been made over many, many years. Uh, does someone who is against this minimum wage increase think it should be back at a dollar? Because if we went from a dollar to two dollars, then that's counterproductive. If we went from two to three, then that's counterproductive, three to four. So what we are seeing over time is that you have to give people the means to have economic mobility. Uh, this is part of it. There have been other states that have raised their minimum wage, uh, certainly above the $10 threshold that are doing well, uh, and their economies are thriving. And what we know is that when we live in an economy that is driven primarily by uh, consumer spending and consumer demand is that when people have more money in their pockets and in their family budgets to spend, that helps economic growth overall. And so the minimum wage is, is one piece of our strategy, but we also want to make sure that people are getting into higher paying, higher wage jobs, what we call middle skill jobs. Uh, get people trained and certified to take these jobs that pay on average between thirty and fifty thousand dollars per year. If you work forty hours a week at the minimum wage, seven twenty five, you make fourteen thousand five hundred dollars per year. If we can get you trained and certified and in a job where you're making $50,000 a year, that's a game changer. There are 175,000 of those jobs open today in the Commonwealth of Virginia. We get people trained, we get them filled. It's a game changer for Virginia's families. Senator, two minutes. Okay, I will tell you what's a game changer. He mentioned in his opening statement that we are in, a, in an election that is about the future of the Commonwealth of Virginia. This entire election is a choice about are you going to take Virginia forward, as he mentioned? Are you going to make decisions that make Virginia more competitive, that incentivize companies to come to Virginia and stay in Virginia? Or are you going to make decisions that make Virginia less competitive and make people leave? And I got news for you. We are on a trajectory that is making people leave Virginia, that is incentivizing people not to stay, not to start businesses. And at the top of that list, anywhere you travel around the Commonwealth of Virginia is, please, please do not raise minimum wage. Minimum wage workers will tell you that. People who run industries, people who want to locate jobs here will tell you that. And I was going to talk about this study in Seattle, but you talked about it already. They have already got, they've done a study. 
The proof is there. Minimum wage workers brought, on average, I think $148 less home every single month. Many people lost jobs because industries went to automation. That's just what rational economic actors do. When you are forced to pay more, and when you consider that the margins are pennies, pennies on the dollar, you will not keep those workers. And that's fundamentally the biggest difference in this lieutenant governor's race between the two candidates that stand before you. Whether it's making Virginia more competitive on minimum wage, whether it's making Virginia more competitive on energy, that's a huge difference between us. And in fact, Justin Fairfax has two other people on his ticket who don't share his position when it comes on energy. And the same thing with right to work. If you repeal our right to work laws, which is an issue that Justin Fairfax has campaigned on, that's another column in the less competitive category. Virginia is at a crossroads. We used to be number one best place to start a family, best tax climate. We're not anymore. We're 33rd in terms of competition, in terms of tax climate. So I would just urge everybody in this room and people who are following this campaign to take into consideration that that's what this race is about. Encouraging people to stay in Virginia and make Virginia more competitive and save those jobs. Mr. Fairfax, one minute. Yes, well, Senator Vogel said that Virginia is becoming less competitive and, and, and we're not attracting companies. Well, uh, she may want to check Facebook today uh, because Facebook uh, just announced that they're bringing a $1 billion data center to the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, and so if we're becoming less competitive, Facebook obviously did not get that message, uh, nor did uh, any of the many companies who have relocated here in the last three and a half years. Nestle in Northern Virginia, $17.6 billion of new capital in the Commonwealth of Virginia in the last three and a half years. Uh, the problem with what Senator Vogel has just said and what she's consistently said in this campaign uh, are facts. Uh, facts are inconvenient things that get in the way. Uh, and Facebook did not say that, you know, please don't raise the minimum wage or we'll come. Facebook is putting shovels in the ground today on a $1 billion project. Uh, so we have to stop this outmoded uh, way of thinking. Again, I would ask Senator Vogel, when the minimum wage was at $2, should it ever have gone to 3 I guarantee you, uh, if we were back transported in that time, she'd be arguing we can't go to 3 because it would be catastrophic. Uh, we're at 725 right now. Uh, what we need to do is to grow our economy and give people economic mobility, and that's what we're focused on. Thank you. Staying with the economy, Senator Vogel, you've taken a pledge to never raise taxes. In 2013, you voted against a tax increase package for transportation that Governor McDonnell and many Republicans called the first sustainable long-term transportation plan in 27 years. Since then, we've seen considerable resources spent on road building in Hampton Roads and Northern Virginia. What do you say to critics who say that taking a no-tax pledge is irresponsible and that you put ideology ahead of progress in opposing that 2013 transportation package? Well, I will just say this. I always put um, what is in the best interest of the community that I represent above all else, not ideology. But I will also tell you that it has been my experience that Virginia has a spending problem most of the time and not a revenue problem, and it's a question of priorities. It's a question of using those transportation resources carefully and only for transportation, locking those dollars up in a lockbox. Um, doing things like prioritizing how we spend those dollars and th doing things like smart scale, which when we first passed that initial legislation, we did not have. We had people making it as a sort of parochial political decision and not doing it in a smart way where you actually had real metrics for how you were spending those dollars. So I consider transportation funding of the highest priority. Making Virginia competitive, and we talk about the difference between comp making Virginia competitive versus not making Virginia competitive, I rank t transportation at the very top of that list. It's investing in infrastructure. It's investing in metro. It's doing our share in metro. Um, it's doing all of the parts of, you know, investing in Hampton Roads in Northern Virginia. You know, we just recently saw a study that that part of Stafford is now number one in the country. So I am all in for transportation, and I am not, uh, I'm not, you know, not kidding myself, you have to pay for it. So I get it, I understand it, and I have you know, made a commitment to the Commonwealth of Virginia to be a very good steward of our state's resources, and I will spend the money absolutely as much as is necessary to make transportation work. Mr. Fairfax, two minutes. Yeah, uh, again, unfortunately, uh, facts get in the way, and uh, Senator Vogel, uh, as I've said before, will say one thing and do another. Uh, and this has been a feature uh, of uh, the way she's campaigned, the way she's governed. Uh, she mentioned that transportation is at the top of her list, uh, transportation investment. Well, she voted no on that transportation bill in 2013. There were 26 senators who voted yes on that bill, 12 who voted no. Senator Vogel was one of the 12 no votes. And as you mentioned, this was a transportation bill 
uh, that was put together and sponsored by a Republican governor, Bob McDonald. Uh, it was supported by the Senate Majority Leader, uh, by the House Speaker. Uh, and so this was a bipartisan bill that was crafted uh, and it passed uh, after compromises were made. Uh, it put billions of dollars into our transportation infrastructure and that was a moment of leadership. Uh, and I believe Senator Vogel failed that test of leadership. She voted no. Fortunately, her no vote didn't carry the day uh, and responsible legislators and policymakers invested those dollars so that we could continue to grow uh, as a commonwealth. Uh, she referenced Stafford uh, in the section of 95 being the worst in the country for traffic. Imagine how much worse it would be if Senator Vogel had not, uh, had she prevailed on that no vote and we didn't invest those billions of dollars. Imagine how much more traffic we'd be stuck in. So if Senator Vogel thinks that more traffic over the last four years was the right recipe for economic growth, uh, I think there are a lot of Virginians who would disagree with her, uh, both in the business community, those who are trying to move goods and services, uh, also our families and their quality of life. Uh, so you can't simply say as a bumper sticker, a mailer, a slogan, and you're going to see all these slick TV ads that say one thing when she's actually done another. And Virginians really are looking beyond that. I think they have grown so cynical and tired of that kind of politics. What they want is for you to speak to them factually about what you believe, to say what you've done, uh, to say you know, where you are on the issues. So don't say that you're for transportation infrastructure and that's number one for you and then vote against the most important piece of transportation infrastructure uh, investment legislation that we have had in modern times. Senator, one minute rebuttal. Yeah. So I am unapologetic about that vote. There were lots and lots of great parts of that bill. In fact, I worked on that legislation. I serve on the Finance Committee. There are lots and lots of critical details about that bill. Um, I represent a region of the Commonwealth of Virginia that had grave concerns. And my, my role is, in the 27th district, to represent the interests of, of, of my district. And there were issues with my community who felt like it favored some regions over others. There were issues with smart scale, which at the time wasn't in that piece of legislation. So I vote my conscience. I don't always vote what is the most popular. But I can tell you that I voted what I believed was right at the time. Um, and I, you know, I stand by my vote. All right, thank you. And we're going to move on now to health care and abortion. First question goes to you, Senator. Um, I want to go back, Senator Vogel, to the, their first debate with Mr. Fairfax and about the 2012 ultrasound bill. Um, at that time, you said it was simply an informed consent bill and contained nothing that forced women to do anything against their will. In 2012, however, some critics saw it otherwise. Uh, and here in Virginia, uh, Governor McDonald, staunch pro-life conservative, said, no person should be directed to undergo an invasive procedure by the state without their consent as a precondition to another medical procedure. So why should Virginians believe that this bill wasn't an unwarranted intrusion of government into a personal health care choice? So first of all, in that discussion we had, um, Justin Fairfax made some you know, pretty strong claims about that legislation that were utterly false. I, I, it is clear to me that he had not read the legislation and probably didn't know very much about it. Um, number one, they were false. Number two, that legislation was merely meant to codify the standard of care. Planned Parenthood acknowledged, and there is a study from North Carolina that says you cannot do an abortion without having first done an ultrasound. It is critical, you have to do it in order to determine gestational age and also to determine the kind of procedure that you must do. That was simply what the bill was about. Um, I withdrew that bill, end of story. Um, so that was the issue. Um, the sad part about that whole sort of the environment around that discussion was that there was a memo that actually came out sometime around that time, and I can you know, make that available to you. And it was, it was written by a the legislative aide for a senior Democrat at the time who said, what we really want to do is use this as a partisan ploy. You know, we want to fundraise off of this. We want to make this you know, a, a partisan thing. And, to talk, you know, and that's exactly what happened then. And I would argue that years later now, while we're running on issues of sort of great import in the 2017 election, that this is once again being used in a, th in a way that I believe is meant to exploit women. It's sort of a cheap, you know, partisan ploy, once again, that's not relevant to this election um, to, you know, I think just derail people from a discussion of other things that are very valuable and I think relevant to this discussion and not that. Mr. Fairfax, two minutes. Yeah, uh, I'd love to have more than two minutes because uh, there's so much in there to unpack. I think I just heard Senator Vogel say that this issue is not relevant to this election. Uh, so she's saying that women's health care is not relevant to this election. Uh, I happen to strongly disagree. Women's health care, women's reproductive health is relevant to every election. 
uh, and probably no more important uh, than today. Uh, you mentioned that Governor Bob McDonald himself, a Republican, uh, ran away from this legislation and forcefully went on the record and said that no woman should be forced uh, to have a procedure uh, against her will, uh, particularly one that's medically unnecessary. Uh, this was Governor Bob McDonald's words. And you notice uh, Senator Vogel, and, and this is unfortunate because uh, she claimed uh, at, at the front, and this has been a feature, again, of the politics, an ad hominem attack that clearly I hadn't read it and I, I can't understand the legislation. Uh, well, apparently the entire Commonwealth of Virginia uh, can't understand the legislation because they all had the same view of the effect of what your bill would be, which is also why you pulled it. So you notice I don't attack Senator Vogel personally, uh, but I do stick to the issues and I stick to the facts. Uh, and in this case, Senator Vogel's bill would have forced women to have an invasive transvaginal ultrasound against their will when it was medically unnecessary. Senator Vogel also said uh, that there was uh, some study done or that this was required. Uh, well, here's the question. If it's already required, why do we need a bill from you mandating it? It makes no sense. The point is she's trying to shame women uh, who are exercising their constitutional rights, and she talked about not wanting to take people's rights away, uh, when she has consistently tried to take away the rights of women to make their own reproductive health care choices. So again, uh, I don't need to do ad hominem attacks. Uh, I don't need to attack uh, her as a person, uh, and I won't do that. Uh, but what I will do uh, is stand up for people uh, who are trying to make sure that their rights uh, are protected, particularly for women in the reproductive health care. This was one of the worst bills ever. It made us a laughing stock around the country, and it was Senator Vogel's bill that she sponsored and introduced. Senator Vogel, okay. one minute. If I might respond. The only person that has been making personal attacks in this race is Justin Fairfax. I have been nothing but gracious and polite and talked only about the issues. And he brings this up every chance he gets because there are other issues that he could talk about, but I, I clearly think he is not informed enough on those issues to talk intelligently about them. I just have to put that out there and say that this is just, in, in my view, a cheap way to, to score political points at the expense of women as a way of fear-mongering and to constantly draw attention to this because he thinks that this is a way to win an election. Well, I'm standing here, and it hasn't worked before, and I don't think it's going to work now. And, I, and again, I fundamentally believe that he misunderstands the subject matter. We had an, a debate um, not that long ago on another issue, and it had to do with education. And I just have to raise this point when it comes to the misunderstanding of what we're talking about. We were talking about ed education. It was an important issue. And he was holding himself out as understanding the issue. I was talking about the composite index, which is the formula with which you use to fund education. He thought we were talking about the consumer price index and referred to it that way. And it fundamentally occurred to me that he did not know what we were talking about or how we fund education in Virginia. So I have never attacked him because of that. I have never engaged in the politics of personal attacks. We have different views of how we run Virginia. Your but I, up, I just Senator. want to make that point. Yeah, I have made been it. very respectful. You've made it. Thank you. Thanks. We're, we're going we're to have to move on. We're Sorry, we're under a time restraint. Uh, we're going to go to energy and the environment now. Uh, and Mr. Fairfax, you have the first question. Um, Mr. Fairfax, you've come out against both the Atlantic Coast Pipeline and the Mountain Valley Pipeline, a position that's not shared by Ralph Northam or current Governor Terry McAuliffe. In addition, you've vowed not to accept donations from Dominion Energy, the state's largest utility. What do you say to critics who argue that these are anti-business stances that are outside the mainstream of Virginia politics, will only raise energy costs on consumers, inhibit economic development, and cost Virginians high-paying jobs? Uh, and Bob, I look forward to, to answering that question. I think we need to uh, have a robust discussion about that issue. But I do want to say one thing. I'm going to take my first 20 seconds. You just saw a perfect example of the way that Senator Vogel engages in elections. She said at the outset that I don't attack people personally and then said that I'm not intelligent enough to understand a piece of legislation. Uh, and then she made a false claim uh, in the end. This is exactly what people reject. She just hired her second uh, Trump advisor on her campaign this week. Uh, and so what we can expect is for Senator Vogel to keep going in the gutter uh, in her primary election. Uh, she came out of her primary with her main competitor threatening to sue her for defamation. Okay, this is the kind of politics that she engages in. I have never questioned her intelligence. Uh, my professors at Duke University, Columbia Law School, when I was on the Law Review at Columbia, would be shocked to hear that I'm not intelligent enough to read a piece of legislation. Uh, they gave me all those great degrees. But, uh, but here's what I'm going to stick to in the facts. And on this issue, uh, I'm about economic growth, uh, about growing the economy. I think for a project of this size and scope, uh, the case needs to be made. And what I have said is that based on the facts that I, I have, I don't believe the case has been made. But there have been significant 
uh, opportunities to deal with pro-growth legislation, and we talked about some of them tonight. The 2013 Transportation Bill, which Senator Vogel voted against. I support it. Uh, that was about growing all of Virginia's economy, every sector of our economy. You talk about Medicaid expansion, uh, which Senator Vogel has voted against, says she's 100% against. It would create 30,000 new jobs. Uh, it would cover 400,000 Virginians. We give away $6.6 .6 million every single day uh, that we do not expand Medicaid to other states. And we, to date, since uh, 2014, have given away $10.4 billion in federal money uh, because we have not expanded Medicaid. So Senator Vogel is blocking 400,000 Virginians from getting uh, health care access under Medicaid expansion. Uh, she is against it. She voted against the transportation bill. And we have got to talk about globally growing uh, Virginia's economy. And that's what this debate uh, is all about. So again, I'm going to stick to the facts. And I don't uh, need to do juvenile petty attacks uh, to have this debate. Senator Vogel, okay. two minutes. So I don't think he answered your question about the pipeline. Um, and I think there's a reason he didn't. But let me just back up and say I did not question his intelligence. I questioned how informed he is. I have no doubt Justin Fairfax is very intelligent. In fact, he's an incredibly nice person. I've enjoyed actually being on the trail with him. Um, but I will question how informed he is on many of these issues. And that is why I, you know, I take the position that he has taken very extreme positions that are incredibly hard for him to defend. And in fact, they're so hard for him to defend that his ticket does not agree with him on many of these positions. His ticket doesn't agree with him on health care, and his ticket does not agree with him on energy policy. And the reason for that is, is because you cannot win. You cannot govern Virginia taking the positions on energy policy that Justin Fairfax has taken. You cannot add any new manufacturing jobs east of Richmond unless you're willing to allow clean burning natural gas to expand into Virginia. I've been a big advocate for wind energy, for renewable energy, for solar energy. In fact, I introduced legislation to allow for wind energy, and here's the issue with that. You can't talk about that and be an advocate for that unless you're willing to allow for clean burning natural gas, which is the bridge fuel by which that exists when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow. That's the fundamental issue. And in 2014, when we had the polar vortex and there was not enough natural gas for, for Virginia, and they had to take offline huge users, that's the issue for Virginia. So unless we allow for energy expansion, unless we allow for infrastructure, there will be no new jobs in huge parts of the Commonwealth of Virginia. That is the kind of economic expansion that we, we have to have or we cannot survive. And again, it comes down to a choice of, do you understand these issues? Do you understand what we have to have to make Virginia more competitive versus less competitive? And I come back to that over and over again. That's the decision that we're making in this election. The future of the Commonwealth of Virginia. Will more people come? Will more people invest or will businesses leave? And again, as I travel around the Commonwealth of Virginia, those are the two things that come up all the time when you talk to the business community. It's minimum wage, it's energy, it's right to work. Please let us stay in Virginia. Mr. Fairfax, one minute. Yeah, and, and, and again, I, you know, I, I won't belabor the point, but Senator Vogel is obviously addicted to ad hominem attacks. Uh, she, she, she questioned my intelligence, then she, she didn't. Uh, and then she says, uh, I'm just questioning how informed he is. Uh, we can have a, a, a debate among adults about issues without attacking people personally. Uh, I don't know why, whether it's in her primary, again, where her opponent uh, threatens to sue her for defamation for some of the underhanded tactics that we surely expect to see over the next 32 days that we have seen up to now. Uh, I don't know why she believes you have to engage in that kind of politics, but people are rejecting that. Uh, that's not the way forward. That's not the future. Uh, she also said uh, falsely, again, not a surprise, uh, that my ticket mates disagree with me on health care. Uh, that is blatantly false. We are all for Medicaid expansion, unlike Senator Vogel and her ticket, who would have denied 400,000 people uh, health care under Medicaid expansion, would also create 30,000 jobs. You didn't hear her say a word about Medicaid expansion, uh, because she's wrong on that issue. 31 other states have expanded Medicaid in the District of Columbia, 19 have not. Virginia's one of those 19, and if Senator Vogel were elected, we would continue to be one of those 19 not to expand it. S Senator Vogel, question to you. President Trump and other Republicans have spoken about reinvigorating the coal economy, suggesting that rolling back regulations on the environment could revitalize regions such as Southwest Virginia. Others suggest that plentiful and inexpensive uh, natural gas, along with the increasing cost competitiveness of renewables that you mentioned, would prevent coal from ever again, <clears throat> excuse me, becoming the driver of Southwest Virginia's economy. Do you agree with the president that the coal economy can be revitalized, or do you think Southwest Virginia needs to focus on an alternative? So I think you have to be realistic about the coal economy. Um, the coal economy is never going to be what it once was. So I think we just have to own that and accept that. But 
I take the position that we should, in Virginia, embrace, embrace an all of the above um, sort of energy future, energy policy for the Commonwealth of Virginia. I used to work at the U.S. Department of Energy. I was the Deputy General Counsel of the Department of Energy. I know a lot about energy policy, and I, I have a great sort of vision for what I hope the future of Virginia would be. Virginia should be a leader. We have a lot of natural resources. We have extraordinary wind, solar resources, offshore energy resources, and I think that we need to be focused on utilizing all of those resources to make Virginia competitive to attract businesses to, to Virginia. And the most important thing, getting back to this whole notion of clean burning natural gas, is, is that if we do it right, we will drive energy costs down. We'll bring 20,000 new jobs to Virginia. We'll reduce energy costs by almost $300 million a year. That's a significant impact on the Commonwealth of Virginia. That's a significant impact on consumers and users, on businesses who will come and who will invest. So I appreciate the question, and I think the answer is you have to be realistic. Mr. Fairfax, two minutes. Yeah, uh, you know, the coal economy, and I've been to Southwest Virginia, met with the coal miners, uh, is undergoing a transition. Uh, there are macroeconomic forces at play uh, that are uh, making the future of coal uh, uncertain. And what we have seen is that there has been growth in jobs in so many other sectors. And, and the key is we need to not only continue to grow Virginia's overall economy to make jobs and higher paying jobs more plentiful, but we have to give people the opportunity uh, to get training and certification so that they can transition uh, into higher paying, uh, safe jobs that they can then provide for their families uh, through. Uh, that is one of the most important things that we can do, and we've highlighted this as one of our top priorities, filling those 175,000 what are called middle skill jobs. These are jobs that require more than a four-year high school diploma, but less than a four-year college degree. Uh, they pay on average between thirty dollars and $50,000 per year. Uh, we have 23 community colleges in the Commonwealth of Virginia uh, that are ready and able uh, to provide that training and certification. We have the UVA at WISE, and Dr. Ralph Northam, uh, who is running for governor, is a great candidate, uh, has laid out a proposal to invest in Southwest Virginia, to invest in UVA WISE, to add grad programs which will attract talent and companies and jobs. And that is the future uh, for folks in an in industry in transition. Uh, and so we want to make sure that we are there providing those opportunities, providing those resources uh, so that they can then move up the ladder. When I met with coal miners some months ago, I uh, was actually struck in hearing you know, their concerns and their thoughts about what they said about their sons uh, and daughters and their grandchildren. Uh, they almost to a person talked about how they were going to community college to get HVAC certification, to become a certified welder. Many of them were not following them uh, in the industry, but instead taking advantage of those opportunities to get into those new collar, uh, new middle skill jobs. And so that is part of that natural transition. We want everybody to rise. We want incomes to rise, we want opportunities to rise. Uh, it really has to be our sole focus is growing this economy and growing opportunity for all Virginians, no matter where they live. Senator Vogel, one minute. Um, I would just say that I don't really have anything else to add to that other than um, the question was really about energy policy. And again, I, I support an all the above energy policy that includes coal. But I also agree that we have to invest in Southwest Virginia in other ways. And it will be an energy expansion that allows for more investment, um, for more in, in investment in manufacturing if we allow energy expansion more infrastructure and other avenues of energy that will bring jobs to Southwest Virginia. And absolutely, workforce training, more investment in Southwest Virginia and other ways will bring new, higher, better paying jobs as well. Thank you. We're going to circle back for a moment. Uh, you mentioned uh, Medicaid expansion a moment ago, and I neglected our second health care question. Uh, for Mr. Fairfax, recent polls have shown voters consider health care a critical issue in the Commonwealth. You responded to a candidate questionnaire by noting that you favor Bernie Sanders' Medicare for All proposal as a way to expand access to health care. Most critics of Medicare for All, including a number of Democrats, say it would be prohibitively expensive. It would do little to control health care costs and would increase the role of government significantly. Given the difficulties, the political difficulties, of even passing Medicaid expansion here in Virginia, why would you think Medicare for All would be desirable or, or reasonable? Yeah, well, first of all, I want to talk about this issue because healthcare is, uh, polling is the number one issue on the minds of Virginians. And as I've traveled around, they are critically focused on ways to expand coverage and access. Uh, what I believe and what we're fighting for is that everyone should have access to high quality uh, healthcare. We believe that that should be a right and not a privilege. Uh, Senator Vogel, to this day, uh, is blocking 400,000 Virginians uh, who could already have health insurance under Medicaid expansion. She's making them go without. 
because of her opposition. Uh, I'm blessed to have health insurance. I'm sure Senator Vogel's blessed to have health insurance. I can't imagine leaving 400,000 people, Virginians, uh, without health insurance uh, for no reason other than to uh, try to go against what President Obama uh, put into place in the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and so my view is, however we get there, uh, we need to get to a place where everyone has access to high quality, affordable health care. And you're talking about a federal uh, issue. I want to talk about a live state issue that is before us today that the Lieutenant Governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia can have a say in, that the Governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia will have a say in, uh, that a Senator uh, in the Commonwealth of Virginia will have a say in, and that is Medicaid expansion. That's on the ballot on November the 7th. Uh, so Senator Vogel uh, is you know, going off on tangents, and you'll hear wild numbers about $32 trillion, and uh, when our budget, our biennial budget is $110 billion here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, she's gonna try to make you be distracted and chase uh, a shiny object when in fact on the ballot today for Virginia's families is a question of whether or not 400,000 more Virginians have health care under Medicaid expansion or if they don't. Uh, if you elect Senator Vogel, zero of those 400,000 will get health insurance under Medicaid expansion. Uh, if you were to elect Justin Fairfax and Ralph Northam uh, and Mark Herring, we're going to fight so that 400,000 more get it. So that's what's on the ballot. That is the case in point, And that's what we've got to focus on for decision. Senator, two minutes. Thank you. Uh, it's clear he alluded to the answer to the question because he knows when I made reference to the fact that he is in some ways misaligned with his colleagues on the ticket. Um, I know them well and I do not believe and, and I don't believe they have stated that they agree with his position on health care at all when it comes to this issue. Because Ralph and Mark Herring have governed in Virginia. They know about the budget. This is no longer a discussion about Medicaid expansion. But just to touch on that for a moment, if you without expanding Medicaid to add one additional person onto Medicaid, and I can tell you I know this because I serve on the Finance Committee and I work on budgets. It's already one quarter of our general fund budget and it's growing at 8.9% a year. You have to think about that for a second. That is already almost unsustainable. So if you consider expanding Medicaid, you have to ask yourself, well, where does that money come from? Does it come from K-12, higher education, or transportation? So, but just step away from that for a second because that's not what this discussion is about anymore. We're not talking about Medicaid expansion anymore. We're talking about his pledge, which is for single-payer health care. And people say, well, what's single-payer? That's government-run health care. We're no longer talking about people not having health insurance. We're talking about 5 million people in Virginia who lose their private health insurance. His plan is no more private health insurance in Virginia. I have lots of Democrats who support me. I have lots of independents who support me. I have lots of colleagues in the legislature on both sides of the aisle who all work with me and we all talk about health policy all the time. I cannot think of, I mean, I haven't really engaged in any discussions with anybody who thinks that government-run health care is a solution. And even if they like the idea of it and find it appealing, nobody thinks that we can afford it. It would be an increase in Virginia's budget of 43%. Where do you get that money? That's fundamentally where it comes down to, and that's why the other two people on the ticket don't embrace that position. And I think that, you know, it speaks volumes to where he is aligned, both misaligned with, the, with his colleagues on his ticket and misaligned with the rest of Virginia. So whether it's on energy and the pipeline we just talked about, or whether it's health care, those are two of the biggest issues in this election in Virginia. Health care is the biggest issue, and I would argue that energy, infrastructure, expansion, being able to have jobs in Virginia is probably is two or three. Thank you. Mr. Fairfax, one minute rebuttal. Yes. Uh, Senator Vogel said that we're not talking about Medicaid expansion anymore because she doesn't want to talk about it. Because her position is that she is going to deny 400,000 Virginians, working Virginians, mind you, access to health care under Medicaid expansion. Uh, she asked the question, well, who's going to pay for it? Well, under Medicaid expansion, the Affordable Care Act, which 31 other states have already expanded Medicaid, so we would not be the first. The federal government uh, pays for it. Uh, for the first several years, they paid 100 percent of the cost. Uh, and then for the years after that, it goes to 90 percent. So we'd have to pick up 10 percent of the tab. We also had waivers uh, that if uh, they did not pick up that 90 percent, we could get out of the program. So money and budget in this case is not an excuse because the federal government was going to pick up that tab. Senator Vogel always pivots back uh, to this false point. Uh, and so the question for decision is Medicaid expansion. Uh, I'm running for lieutenant governor who presides over the Senate of Virginia, not the United States Senate, and what's before the Senate of Virginia is Medicaid expansion. And I would support it and vote for it. 
uh, and Senator Vogel has voted against it. All right, thank you, Mr. Fairfax. We have time now for a couple of questions, uh, great questions from our audience. Uh, naturally enough, we're in a, a law school building, so these are questions of law. And uh, Bob will ask uh, Senator Vogel the first question. Uh, Senator Vogel, this is a question about uh, Title IX protections for uh, college-age women with respect to sexual assault. Um, as you know, on the national level, there's a big debate, and Secretary of Education DeVos is basically want to change the guidance, ultimately, that the Department of Education gives to colleges and universities. And what we want to know is, is your position that should we change the manner in which uh, Virginia colleges and universities are applying Title IX protections uh, to women who are uh, victims of sexual assault? Um, well, I will just tell you that as somebody who has been an advocate in Virginia, has introduced legislation, who has worked with victims of sexual assault, who has been an advocate for getting law enforcement involved, who has been an advocate for having colleges and universities um, have to have more transparency, have to report um, incidents of, of sexual assault, I am not in favor of doing anything that walks us back in terms of protecting victims. I think that, one, the actual ability to record those encounters, to have colleges and universities have to be honest about what's happening on their campuses, to have law enforcement involved immediately, and to do everything that you can to protect victims has to be our highest priority. It has been an issue in Virginia, and when you sit down and you meet with the victims, as I have done you know, over time in my office, you sit down, you hear their stories, it is, you know, it is just gut-wrenching. And when you hear the progression of how it has been dealt with, um, the chilling effect on coming forward, what happens when law enforcement gets involved or doesn't get involved, um, I stand staunchly on the side of victims and doing everything we can to be an advocate for them and making that process um, work for them. Mr. Fairbanks? Yeah. And I appreciate that question because that's actually really, really important. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't hear an answer to your question uh, in the Senator's answer. Uh, I am 100% against what Secretary DeVos is trying to do. Uh, in this regard, and, and this really goes back to whether or not uh, we are going to have leaders in the Commonwealth of Virginia who are willing to stand up uh, to Donald Trump, uh, to this administration, when they are taking us down a dark political path. We know that Senator Vogel will not stand up to Donald Trump. Uh, she supported him in the election. She voted for him. Uh, she tweeted on the night that he won that he's going to make America great again. Uh, and that's what she believes. Well, I don't think he's making America great again. Uh, I think that what he and his appointees are doing uh, are unraveling so many of the protections and so much of the progress that we have made as a country, uh, whether it is on this issue of uh, protecting victims of sexual assault through Title IX, uh, and as a federal prosecutor, someone who has prosecuted uh, violent cases, uh, I know about keeping people safe. I know about how important it is to have the resources and the ability uh, to go in and have law enforcement uh, investigate and back up uh, folks on college campuses, uh, but also uh, in every other area. Uh, whether it's this horrific uh, Puerto Rico response uh, where this president uh, chastises the mayor of Puerto Rico and the citizens, literally as many of them are drowning, uh, whether it's removing DACA away from 800,000 people. Uh, Senator Vogel, who doesn't mention that she's a Republican in her ass, doesn't mention Donald Trump uh, ever, uh, supports him wholeheartedly. Uh, and so the question is whether or not we want a Virginia uh, that's going to go along to get along with the Trump administration, that's going to do whatever uh, he wants, uh, is going to rubber stamp uh, this administration and Senator Vogel time and time and time again, uh, along with her running mates Ed Gillespie and John Adams, have been radio silent when this president uh, has embarrassed us as a nation, uh, has rolled back protections for Americans, uh, and they want to stand by and act as if they have no responsibility for that. When they voted for him, they supported him, and she, again, said that she believes he'll make America great again. Well, he's not making America great again. And what we have to do is we have to stand up as Virginians and say we're choosing a different path. We're rejecting that kind of politics. You have one, one minute. Thank you. So I am unapologetic about wanting to make Virginia great again, about wanting to make America great again, about being Republican. But I am also unapologetic about the fact that 10 years in the Senate of Virginia, I have never been afraid to break with my party and to put principle over politics, and I have done it over and over again. And in the case of DeVos, I'd be happy to break with her and say if I wasn't clear that no, I don't agree with that. But I can, I can give you a long litany of instances when I've broken with my party before, and I am committed that as your next lieutenant governor, I would always vote my conscience. I would always vote what was right 
for the Commonwealth of Virginia and stand at the, at the dais and not play partisan games and not rule something not germane because I thought it was a partisan, you know, somebody was demanding that I do that for my party. And I can tell you that when I was first elected and Governor Bob McDonald put forward a budget that borrowed from the Virginia retirement system to balance that budget, and I was young and was first elected, I voted no. And that was the governor of my own party. I voted against uranium mining. I was one of two Republicans to do that. I voted for non-discrimination. I voted for redistricting reform against my party. I voted for ethics reform, for medical marijuana, a whole litany of things that took leadership. And so I just want to say for that, for that case, I, you have my commitment. Thank you. Our final question of the night, again, an audience question involving the law. You're both attorneys. We're in a law school building. At times in recent years, there have been high profile fights over judicial selection. Does our system for picking judges work? Why or why not? Senator Vogel? Mr. Fairfax. My first again. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I, oh, my mistake. To. Thank you, Bob. Happy Mr. To. Fairfax. Yeah. You know, uh, no system is perfect. Mm -hmm. And of course, here in the Commonwealth of Virginia, our judges are selected by our legislature. Uh, and so that obviously brings in uh, some issues around politics and, and horse trading. And I have actually uh, been someone who has been actively engaged in making sure uh, that we have a judiciary that reflects the diversity of the Commonwealth of Virginia. I uh, helped found an organization that's focused on having uh, more minorities and others participate. We saw incredible imbalances uh, where legislators were selecting uh, friends of friends and not really openly opening up the pool uh, of talent of people who can serve as distinguished jurists. Uh, I myself, when I graduated from Columbia Law School, uh, clerked for a federal judge, Judge Gerald Lee, uh, who used to sit on the Fairfax County Circuit Court bench. Uh, and so I have had tremendous experience uh, in this regard. And, and I think that what we have to do is make our system as transparent uh, as it co possibly can be. We need to make sure that more people uh, who want to take on uh, the mantle of leadership to be a judge at any one of our uh, levels, uh, that they have that opportunity, they're treated fairly, given a fair hearing, uh, that it's not just the you know, good old boys or good old girls network. We gotta make sure that everyone uh, gets a shot uh, at that opportunity. Uh, and so, you know, it, it has worked. We've had some great judges who have served at our Supreme Court, our Court of Appeals, our Circuit Court, uh, our Juvenile Domestic Relations Court, our General District Court. Uh, we've had some really great jurists uh, who have served, and I've been fortunate to meet many of them. Uh, but what we have to do is increase transparency, uh, the way these selection processes work, and I have sat in uh, on some of these, and we need to make sure that more people get that, that opportunity. Senator Vogel. Thank you. Um, well, I will say I think Virginia does a good job. Um, I know other states, I have a friend who has a sister who was running in North Carolina, and I was listening to her describe this campaign, and I thought, wow, that's bad. Um, so I'm proud, actually, of the way we do it in Virginia. Um, there are other states you could argue that maybe perhaps do it somewhat better, but I will just tell you that in my t tenure in the Senate of Virginia, I've been involved in judicial selection um, year after year. And I can tell you that we take it very seriously. It is very thorough. We look into the, the, you know, the character of the person. We consider their background and their qualifications. And we do it in a way that I believe is fair and bipartisan. And I have been a part of selecting both people who are Democrats or, or Democratic leaning and, or Republican and Republican leaning and appointed them to judges. And so I have confidence in the process. Um, I believe that it is better to appoint judges in a process that is thorough, that gives people the opportunity to come in and interview and put themselves forward better than <coughs> running as a campaign. Because I, I think that creates a lot of challenges in the community when you are an elected judge and then have people come before you. So I think we do a good job. And the people that I serve with in the region that I represent are men and women of great integrity, and they take that process very, very seriously, and I think we have done a good job. You have one minute, Mr. Fairfax. Uh, so again, I, I would just reiterate that we need to make sure that the process is transparent, that more people get uh, that kind of opportunity. We have been very fortunate to have had some great and distinguished jurists uh, to serve here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, we have a great civil system and criminal system. And again, as someone who has been a law clerk, who's been a federal prosecutor, uh, who has been a private practicing uh, attorney, uh, I have seen uh, the way the system works. And I believe that we can always strive to uh, improve it. Uh, and I should just make a note here about criminal justice reform, which is something that uh, I've highlighted in this race. We do need uh, to tackle issues around the school to prison pipeline. Uh, where Virginia is number one in the nation. Uh, we do need to make sure that we're not spending tremendous amounts of money to lock juveniles up and others up, uh, and yet under-investing in education, not giving 400,000 Virginians health care, uh, not providing people with the opportunities they need to actually rise, and instead throwing that money 
uh, behind in some ways what can be considered a broken criminal justice system. So judges are a part of that, prosecutors, public defenders, probation officers, and as Lieutenant Governor, I help lead on that score as well. Well, thank you both for answering the questions. Uh, the round of questions now has concluded. Uh, it is time for your final statements. And per the coin toss, Senator Vogel, you will go first. Thank you. I would just like to thank everybody for your attention tonight. There are so many issues that we didn't get to did not get to discuss. He mentioned just a minute ago criminal justice. Um, Virginia has a lot of challenges, but Virginia also has awesome, awesome opportunities. And the decision that you make this November when you go to the polls is not about people. It's not about personalities. Um, it's about issues. It's about the decisions that we make on issues, whether they're related to how we're going to reform our criminal justice rules. It's about what we're going to do when it comes to issues of making Virginia more or less competitive. Tax reform, regulatory reform, energy, the environment. All of these are some of the biggest issues that we need to tackle to make decisions about what Virginia will look like in the next 10 years and 20 years. Higher education, workforce training. And I can just say that I have worked on these issues for 10 years. I have been involved in working through our budget process, putting, putting this legislation forward. And many of the bills that I have introduced are the bills that didn't pass back then. And now they are the big issues that we're talking about now, and I would love to be a part of making that difference. And using, leveraging the position of lieutenant governor, strong statewide leadership with a vision, is what it takes to actually get people on both sides of the aisle to agree and to work together. And my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, I believe, have worked with me, respect me, and would, we could work really well together to actually change Virginia. And I have a record of doing it, and I would be so honored to have your support in this election for Lieutenant Governor. And again, I appreciate the opportunity to be with you tonight. Thank you. Mr. Fairfax, two minutes. Yes. Uh, again, I want to thank uh, you both, our moderators. I want to thank Senator Vogel, our hosts here at uh, University of Richmond. Uh, and the Virginia Bar Association for this opportunity. Uh, I also want to just say hello to my wife, Dr. Serena Fairfax, and to our two young children, uh, Cameron and Karis. Your bedtime is in 30 minutes, so please go to sleep. Uh, but uh, I, I really am uh, happy about this opportunity uh, for us to get to discuss the issues, and I think it needs to be about the issues. Uh, it doesn't need to be about ad hominem attacks and questioning someone's intelligence and questioning whether they're informed on an issue or not. That's not what gets us to higher ground. And that's what Virginians are rejecting. Uh, we have led in every single poll that's been published in this election. Uh, and I think that's reflective of the fact that we've had a positive vision. Uh, we're not about the politics of personal destruction, of tearing someone down, uh, of going into the gutter. Uh, and that's what Virginians want to see going forward. It's why we rejected Donald Trump last year, uh, and we went blue, the only southern state to have done that by five percentage points. And it's why we're going to reject this kind of negative politics uh, and personal ad hominem attacks this go around on November the 7th. Uh, Virginians want aspirational leadership. Uh, they want leadership that's hopeful, that's positive, that focuses on growing our economy, giving everyone an opportunity to rise, making sure that 400,000 Virginians don't go without health care solely for political reasons, that we can raise wages, transition people into higher paying jobs, uh, that we can do the things that allow the great American story to be possible. Uh, it's a story that I'm passionate about because it's one that I've been blessed to live. Uh, as you heard at the outset, uh, I was raised by two great parents, but primarily by my uh, mom and by my late maternal grandparents, two incredible people. My grandfather was a World War II veteran, Howard University graduate. He worked at the Postal Service for 45 years. My grandmother, Howard University graduate, worked as a nurse at Freedman's Hospital for over 40 years. Uh, when they took us into their home, all five of us, it changed the trajectory of our lives. My mom was able to, with the help of my dad and others, send all four of her children to college and two of us to law school. That's the American story. It's a story that's playing out right here at the University of Richmond. We heard so many people, and we want to play out for everyone in the Commonwealth of Virginia. So we honored to earn your vote November the 7th, and thank you for this opportunity. All right, thank you both for your, your cooperation tonight as I navigated the proper order of questions. That concludes tonight's debate. I'd like to thank President Crutcher, Dean Perdue, uh, the U of R in general, and the Virginia Bar Association, as well as the Young Lawyers Division, for making this possible tonight. And thank you and the audience for your cooperation throughout. Uh, and now, uh, I guess everyone is invited to a reception just outside. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.